A very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Inside on Equinox Television, broadcasting from Cameroon's economic capital, Douala. I am Babla Jonathan. Two explosive devices discovered by some inhabitants of Kumba in the Meme Division, southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon, and destroyed by security and defense forces within less than 24 hours. Another one explodes and kills two individuals in a cock still in the southwest region of Cameroon, and two fire incidents recorded in the town of Kumba in less than 48 hours. Hours. In the meantime, the Canadian High Commission in Cameroon paints a disturbing picture of humanitarian crisis in the country provoked by the close to five year long armed conflict in the northwest and southwest regions of the country, the Boko Haram terrorist security challenges in the far north region of the country, and security problems emanating from uh, sporadic incursions by silica rebels from the Central African Republic in the east of the country and the organization or the High Commission of Canada indicates that about 4.4 million people are now in need of humanitarian assistance in the Republic of Cameroon. This is Cameroon this week. We'll also take a look at why Africa is still unable to make giant developmental steps forward despite its huge natural and human resources or potentials. Meet our guest in some few seconds. Our guest today, Dr. Ita Ewane, Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Karls Hochschule, the Karls Hochschule International University in Germany. He is joining us today from Mali. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, Babila, and it's always a pleasure of being in your company. Right. We begin with these uh, recent incidents recorded notably in the town of Kumba in the Meme Division, southwest region of the country. Two explosive devices discovered at very close intervals of time within less than 24 hours. One discovered at the entrance into the Kumba market and another one discovered not far from there around a filling station in the town of Kumba. What's your analysis of these happenings? Yeah, Mr. Babila, I just want to say uh, what we are experiencing in Cameroon with the discovery of uh, explosive uh, devices, in, notably in Kumba and Ekok, it's an indication that the conflict is intensifying. And contrary to claims made by some pundits of the Yaoundé regime that everything is under control, so what we are experiencing right now, it's the changing nature of the conflict in Cameroon. And uh, if care is not taken with the two uh, explosive devices discovered in Kumba today, if care is not taken, this conflict would soon be urbanized. So we will see such explosive devices in other places out of the hmm. and the Northwest region. So explosive devices maim and kill indiscriminately. And uh, the introduction of these devices into the conflict in Cameroon further complicate, complicates uh, efforts to mitigate and uh, respond adequately to the conflict in the Northwest and the Southwest. And explosive devices endanger lives of both uh, civilians, Ambazonian fighters, and those of the soldiers of the Republic of Cameroon. So this is a warning to the government that this go uh, conflict is further deteriorating and that it is time to put in place adequate measures to address the conflict. So we don't have to allow it to slip out of our hands. It's been on for five years. And for five years, we have const constantly seen how this conflict has metamorphosed. So it's taken a new dimension and no one knows what will happen again in the coming days. In so it's time to act. In Kumba, the explosive devices uh, were discovered by some inhabitants and subsequently destroyed by the police, and nobody died in uh, the two uh, cases. But in Ekok, uh, those who actually, uh, or the bomb exploded, the locally made bomb exploded and killed two persons. And there are questions surrounding 
these uh, cases, notably in Kumba, questions like who uh, planted the explosive devices, where they were discovered, how did they get there? Of course, the uh, security and defense forces and the authorities are attributing uh, those uh, happenings to the non-state armed groups, but it is not clear as of now who planted the explosive devices and how did they get to the entrance of the Kumba market, a place that is usually crowded. Uh, how did they get to that filling station, the Bokom filling station, a place where people are always around there to plant the bombs? Uh, I think the most important question for Cameroonians right now is not who planted the bombs, but we have to deal with the fact that we actually have uh, explosive devices in Cameroon at the moment, and that's what should be troubling us. So who planted is not very important. Fact is, there are explosive devices being applied in Cameroon, and the danger, like I said, is for everybody. So uh, Kumba is a place, and this is also an indication that the military doesn't have total control of the situation. Despite the massive presence of uh, the armed forces, the police and the gendarmes in Kumba, people have still been able to penetrate the city center and implant explosive devices. So it's an indication that we do, the government does not have total control of the situation and that more adequate measures need to be taken. Now, people in Kumba, like those in other parts of Cameroon, enjoy some fundamental freedoms. And one of those freedoms is the freedom of movement. So you can't stop people from moving in Kumba, and you can't search everyone moving. You can't say who is an, uh, an Ambazonian, who is an enemy, who is a soldier in plain cloth. So people have that freedom to move around. And as they move, they take with them so many devices, so many things like we've seen. So it can be planned. Uh, where the Bokom filling station is at the heart of Kumba. And so if they can succeed in planting an explosive device in such an open space, it means no one is safe anywhere in Kumba. I remember I was in Kumba last January and they found an explosive device in front of a kiosk that is just a few meters away from the Kumba uh, Central Police Station. So you see how far they can go. And so the danger is real and we need to face it. And that's the most important thing for us right now. Mm. And the case of a cop where uh, some persons were killed by the explosive uh, device, uh, the military or the authorities have said that uh, those who were killed uh, were actually non-state armed group fighters who actually wanted to plant the bomb, but uh, wrongly manipulated it and exploded and killed them. But there are still questions as to how the explosive device was being planted in an area where there is a police control, a security control post. What, what happened? How did, the, uh, come, how did it come about that they arrived there to plant the explosive device and to the extent that it killed uh, some persons? Yeah, Mr. Babila, what else did you expect from this government that has lost every credibility? Did you expect them to say those who implanted the bombs were members of the armed forces? Obviously not. So it's so easy to... Even though some fingers accusing fingers are it's, pointing towards the military also. Of course, it's so easy to point fingers at the Amazonians. But fact is, a bomb, a bomb exploded and killed two persons. If the government says... It, the two persons that got killed were Ambazonians. How did they get to identify them? Were they carrying Ambazonian uh, ID cards that identified them as Ambazonians? So there are two people who got killed, and there was an explosive device that exploded in an area that is heavily manned by police officers and members of the armed forces. This is a border control post that is supposed to be manned 24 hours on 24. So we all have a right to ask ourselves this very important question. What happened? What, what, where were the, uh, the supposedly the security officers who are entrusted with the responsibility to ensure total security at the borders of Cameroon? So this is to tell you that uh, the conflict has gone out of hand. 
and that it is time to take action. So mm. it's so it's so difficult to identify the perpetrators. Okay. The Ambazonians are saying uh, uh, it was done by members of the armed forces. Members of the armed forces are saying, well, the government, it was done by Ambazonians. And we keep moving around in this uh, vicious circle. It's not helping anyone. People are dying, and it's not time to make accusations, but to find adequate solutions, appropriate solutions to real problems. We'll talk about that solution in a short while. Now, what do you think about the switch from uh, some uh, minor weapons to sophisticated weapons and explosive devices uh, now coming into play, increasingly being planted here and there, killing persons, destroying properties, putting people at risk at different places. What do you think can possibly explain that switch, that twist of the crisis? Of course, uh, Mr. Babila, you can see the various transformations that this conflict has taken from the time uh, it started in uh, 2016. Uh, what we first saw were people demonstrating with, with uh, peace plans and the government reacted violently. Now, they went on, got locally made weapons, then guns. The government intensified its uh, military uh, solution, brought in more uh, members of the armed forces. The Ambazonians acquired uh, automatic rifles because they have the right to self-defense. That is a fundamental right in international law. Uh, people that are being oppressed, uh, people that are being... Uh, those rights are being trampled upon. People who are being killed and maimed by those that are supposed to protect them, they have to look for other means to protect themselves. So there is a legitimate right to self-defense. And that's what I think they have been doing because as the conflict keeps changing, as the government continues to prioritize the use of the military solution, Ambazonians continue to look for other options. And this is what we've been seeing in the, for the past uh, five years. Now we've gotten to the stage that Ambazonians or uh, non-armed state groups have started producing locally made bombs. This is to tell you that the danger is real. We, and as the years pass by, they will acquire more skills and they will be able to, pro, uh, to produce more sophisticated explosive devices. That will be able not just to explode a, uh, an armored car, but then that will be able to claim a thousand lives at a time. So like I said before, and I'm still saying it, Cameroon needs to change its strategy. The government of Cameroon, and we've all been advocating for this. We've all been warning this government from the start of the conflict in 2016, that if you continue to prioritize the military solution, the conflict will change its nature and it will become more dangerous. That's, we've gotten to that stage right now. But that's not the end of it. We still have an opportunity if the government demonstrates the political will to try to put an end to this conflict. We can do that if we want to. But there should be a clear a political will to do so. Non-state armed groups producing weapons, producing explosive devices. Doesn't that speak of a bleak future? Of course, uh, the, we had the opportunity to avoid this. We did it. It's not that something that we are experiencing in Cameroon. It's been happening in other places, and that's why we kept, some of us kept warning the government of Cameroon, that, that be careful, do not allow this situation to further deteriorate, because if it does, you might never be in the position again to control it. And we've gotten to that stage. The government of Cameroon is not in any position right now to be able to control that conflict. And that's why we've been advocating for external help. Of course, we can show some political will, but we need help from others to help us take the arms out of this, uh, the hands of uh, people who are not supposed to be possessing arms. But then when you push the people to a wall and you backstop the wall, they do not have any means again to ret retreat. The next thing to, they have to do is fight back. And this is what we are experiencing in Cameroon, in the Northwest and the Southwest. And Cameroon is fighting a, a war on several fronts. Like you rightly mentioned in your introductory uh, speech, you talked about the fight with the Boko Haram in the north. There are, there are the anti uh, seleka in the east. This is a, Cameroon is fighting on a multiple fronts. 
and they do not have the means, they do not have the human resources to be able to face this. And so the first conflict they should earn, to try to put an end to, is the one that is internal. So resolve the conflict in your house, and then together you can put your hands, you can put your hands together to confront the external enemy. But if you're fighting at home, you give you leave some open space for the external enemy to exploit your territory. You think that the Cameroon government is no longer up to the task as far as the security challenges, not only in the northwest and southwest regions, but also in the far north and in the east regions are concerned, but more specifically in the case of the northwest and southwest regions of the country, as it is, of course, uh, the case with the other uh, regions, the far north and the east region, the authorities have repeatedly said the government, the state, is standing tall. The state is standing tall and in control of the situation on the ground. Recently, we heard that from the governor of the Northwest region during a security meeting in the Kumbu, in the Bui Division, uh, when he said that the security and defense forces, the administration, is in total control of the situation. OK. Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Babila, People like uh, Governor Lele Lafrique have been, are those that are misleading this government. Instead of telling them the truth, he keeps on saying the situation is under control. And at the same time, he parades the streets of the Northwest in an armored car and with a military convoy. The normal citizen, like they say in French, the Citoyen uh, Lambda, they do not have the possibility or the opportunity that uh, Governor Lele Lafrique has so they don't have uh, armored cars. They are not accompanied by military convoys, and so they get themselves killed every day. So if Governor Lele Lafrique believe, truly believes that he has total control of the situation, he should stop moving around in an armored car. He should stop moving around with military convoys. So what, we, what we've known about our governors in the past is that they were able to move around the cities under their jurisdiction and uh, interact with the people that they control, that they administer. Now, if you cannot do that, it means you've lost control of the situation. And Governor Lele Lafrique is not in control of the Northwest uh, region. Recently, just last week, we saw, I think it was the 40th anniversary of... Uh, Bishop George Ko of the uh, Kumbu Diocese. Bishop John Ko into uh, priesthood. And we saw, uh, we had gunshots. And so this, is, this has been going on, and people keep telling lies. The governor who is on the ground needs to inform his hierarchy in Yaoundé of what is actually going on in, the, in Bamenda, in the Northwest, so they can look for appropriate solutions. Now, those people who have passed the retirement age have only one worry. It's just to stay in power again, stay in office and make some more money. Some of them miss the golden opportunities the, government, the country offered them, and they are trying to catch up at the, the last minute. So he's more interested in staying in power. So they keep him there because he's been giving them that assurance that he has the situation under control. That's not true. That's a fallacy. And the people of Cameroon deserves to be told the truth. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the uh, administrators. The governor of the Northwest region is one of the administrators who has been uh, described as somebody who is friendly who is diplomatic in his approach, in talking with the people, in talking about the situation uh, on the ground and so on. Don't you, uh, do you, don't you share that opinion? How can you describe a governor who sees right and says it's white as being diplomatic, as being friendly? How can you describe someone who goes on the media to propagate lies about a dire situation? People are dying. And a governor who is supposed to be the number one personality in the Northwest region has not been able to tell the truth. And you describe him as friendly. What is friendly? It's not sufficient to meet people and say, good morning. It's being friendly. It's about the actions that you take. It's about the words or the reports that you make that describe with precision the situation on the ground. So it's not about moving around and greeting people. He cannot even do that again. He cannot do that anymore because he's, he is not a free man. A governor who moves with a military convoy is not a free man. He should be able to visit 
all units of uh, his uh, administration, the area of ju jurisdiction, if he can go, be able to go to Furawa, if he can be able to go to Wum, to Fang, to Widikum, and to other places, the, uh, then to Sabongari, then we will know he is truly the governor of the Northern uh, uh, region and that he has the situation under control. And so if it's not able to move to some places because of security concerns, I think it serves the people good that he shuts up. Mm. But isn't that better than some of the warlike speeches, hate speech that we have been hearing from some administrative authorities, notably in the Southwest region? Yeah, someone who uh, propagates hate, hate speech and the one who tells lies, who sees blue and says it's red. I just put them in the same basket. They are the same types of individuals. I don't think the governor of the Northwest or the Southwest, they are different from each other. They serve the same administration. They have been given the same assignment. They received instructions and they are doing just exactly as they, been, as they have been instructed to do. Of course, if you leave these people freely, they would be able to paint another picture of the situation in the Northwest and the Southwest. These are the citizens of Cameroon. So they should be, the governor of the Southwest should be able to go to Akwaya. He should be able to go to Libyalem within without a military convoy. That's when you know you have the situation under control. So propagating hate speech, calling people dogs, some talking and uh, we've heard journalists uh, talking about uh, the ratization of the Anglophone uh, populations in areas like Yaoundé. Of course, uh, I'm sorry, but all of this has been, is being documented, Mr. Babila, and uh, the time of, uh, for atonement is soon. Mm. All right, we're going to go to the newsstands now and we take a look at what the newspapers reported this week. We'll be right back in some few minutes. Immaculate Fogwe with the press review. The Crown, COVID-19, explosion of cases, 3,000 plus positive and 37 deaths registered in a week. Cameron Insider reports, COVID-19, resurgence, danger looms in schools. The Advocate, COVID-19 second wave, government hits hard on barrier measures. The Guardian Post says, Minad Bose orders governors, senior divisional officers and divisional officers to reinforce the fight against COVID-19. The Sun, containing COVID-19 surge, Cameroonians unmoved by government's fresh push. Eden, International Women's Day in Yaoundé, women defy government's ban on public manifestation. The Post Weekend reports West Cameroon sitting on riches but walking in poverty. The Horizon exclaims, Sour Wednesday, alleged separatist fighters shut down the entrance into the town of Bamenda. The Garden Post exclaims, a new and national shame. The Star, Cameroon Development Corporation travel ban imposed on top management. The media questions what is really going on at the CDC after the police trailed some corporation workers. Another edition of the Garden Post says, March session of parliament heads may roll in the Senate and National Assembly bureaus. The Post, Maximilian Gombe, receives International Woman of Courage Award from the United States Embassy. Thanks, Immaculate Fogwe, for the press review. The High Commission of Canada in Cameroon paints a disturbing picture of humanitarian crisis in the Republic uh, caused by the Anglophone crisis, the Boko Haram security challenges in the far north, and the Silico uh, rebel security problems in the east region of the country. And according to the Canadian High Commission, there are now about 4.4 million people in need of humanitarian aid. And that figure has increased from a little above 3 million in 2020 to above 4 million. What's your take on these uh, figures reflecting a worsening humanitarian 
situation or crisis in Cameroon, Dr. Itaiwane? Uh, I think the Canadian High Commission did not just uh, describe a dire situation. That's the reality on the ground. Uh, Cameroon, the, the humanitarian uh, situation, it's, uh, it's quite disturbing. And uh, Mr. Babila, I would just like to remind you that in conflict, the bullet kills just a few people. The most, da the most dangerous part of it is the resultant uh, humanitarian crisis that even comes at the end of the conflict. And Cameroon is already experiencing that. You have a, a huge influx of Cameroonians into Nigeria. I was recently watching a, a video of uh, the visit of Dr. Christopher Fomunyo to the Cameroonian refugees in Nigeria. And you could see little children without any future, no education, because they can't even go to school. You could see uh, how some of our little girls have been induced and pushed into prostitution because they need to survive. You could see parents who have, who have been reduced to beggars, people who had a means of livelihood at home, people who had homes, they, have a mean, they had a means to survive. So you, you find this is happening in Cameroon, in internally displaced people. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of Cameroonians walk in the streets of uh, Douala in Bonaberry around the motor park. You can see how our people have been reduced in, uh, into destitutes, to destitutes in their own country. You look at the situation in the far north with the increasing number of Cameroonian refugees, Cameroonians fl fleeing into Nigeria, Nigerians fleeing into Cameroon. Now, people without any hope, no means of feeding themselves. So the government is forced to jump in to try to take, the government has the responsibility to take care of these people. The government's resources, it's, itself has been uh, depleted. The government is running out of financial and, uh, and uh, human resources because of uh, the many fronts that it's confronted, uh, conflicts on different fronts. We find the situation in the East, uh, refugees from the, the Central African Republic. So Cameroon finds itself in a real disaster. And like I say, there is a need for Cameroon to reconsider its position there is a need to end the conflict, the internal conflict. And Mr. Babila, just before I, I will step out of your question a little bit, to say uh, that we have a real need for uh, national dialogue and reconciliation to ease pains. The pain is deep, the wounds are deep. And uh, if you ask me today how anyone is going to heal the pains in the Northwest and the Southwest, honestly, I do not have a real solution except for the fact that I can advocate for a real national dialogue and a truth and reconciliation commission in Cameroon. So because all of us as Cameroonians have been affected by this conflict in one way or the other, you can say for certain, Mr. Babila, that you've lost a relative in this conflict, you've lost a friend or just a neighbor in the conflict. And so we have all been affected as Cameroonians and there is need for a, a truth and reconciliation commission to be set up so that wounds can be healed pains can be relieved. Mm. What's your opinion about uh, what government has been doing so far to improve on the living conditions, the deplorable living conditions of the, the victim of victims of these crises, the IDPs, internally displaced persons who have moved out of the northwest and southwest uh, regions in thousands and are now seeking refuge, many of them living in very difficult conditions in different parts of the country, refugees in neighboring Nigeria in their thousands. And you mentioned uh, the, the visit of Dr. Christopher Formunio there, and he told me uh, that during his visit there, the people did not tell him about any visit from any Cameroonian authority. They mentioned the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and the Nigerian authorities and the communities welcoming them, helping them in one way or the other. But they didn't talk about any Cameroonian authority who went there to visit them. In the far north region of the country, thousands of persons have been displaced by the Boko Haram uh, security challenges there. And some little efforts have been made there to kind of bring back the people to their communities and revive life and bring them back to live in, as they were living before. What do you think about all these efforts and what is done, what is not done? Yeah, Mr. Pavela, when you ask me what I think on 
about what the government has been doing to bring assistance to the many uh, displaced Cameroonians. You see me smiling. <laughs> I don't know if you're really serious about that question. Because I think there is an, uh, your question is the answer itself. There's an answer in the question. The government has not done anything. The government has not visited the Cameroonian refugees in Nigeria, to the best of my knowledge, because we have the opportunity to talk to some of these uh, refugees. We've had friends who visited these uh, refugees. We belong to organizations that have been uh, uh, bringing assistance to some of the refugees, both at home and abroad. So uh, what has the government been doing? Uh, do you know of any center in the Northwest and Southwest where the government is providing assistance to the displaced, the internally displaced people? Do you know of any uh, center in the in Yaoundé, Duala, where the government is providing assistance to the internally displaced people? This government has not been doing anything. The few things we've seen is uh, a few administrators who parade around with four or five bags of rice and distribute to people who sometimes are not even refugees. Uh, people just need to know that the governor, is, uh, the SDO, the divisional officer, is standing somewhere with four bags of rice, and you will see people st uh, stepping out of their houses, pretending to be refugees. The people in the Northwest and Southwest did not leave because of hunger. They are not asking this government for food. They had enough food. They want to return to their homes. They want to have their villages rebuilt. We had this commission uh, led by uh, the famous man from uh, Le Bialem, uh, I've forgotten his name, and uh, my former secondary school teacher, Donatus Njong. So what has become of this com commission? How many villages have they rebuilt? Come on, Mr. Babila, we need to come out of this comedy and start proposing uh, real solutions to real problems. The problems are enormous and we need to tackle them one at a time. So. By the end of the year, we must, must have moved a step forward. But don't ask me what this government has been doing. The government has not done anything. While the solutions are being uh, put in place uh, gradually and being discussed by government and other stakeholders, these uh, victims of the security challenges, they have to leave. They have to uh, come out of the misery and the horrible situations in which they find themselves. And uh, this is, of course, why we saw for some time the Minister of Territorial Administration, some governors and DOs, SDOs, uh, moving to the people with aid from government and with aid from the President of the Republic, Paul Beer. Uh, what about that? Come on, Mr. Babila, uh, like I said, we need to come out of this comedy show. Now, uh, even the young fighters, some of the young men who voluntarily left the bushes and uh, joined the DDR centers, what have we seen? We see them constantly in the streets because the government has not been able to keep its words. The government has not been able to meet the promises that were made to these young men. Uh, you talked about a certain minister of uh, territorial administration. I I'm sorry to say this, but I have to say it. You need to be a poor guy to be able to appoint someone like that gentleman as a minister. We saw him parading with mattresses. You, you give him mattresses to people living in the streets. Where do they place the mattresses to sleep on? Those people did not leave their homes because they wanted to. Those people have only a single one worry at, the, at this moment. They want to return to their homes. And the government came up with a plan, a reconstruction plan. It's over a year and no single village has been reconstructed. Uh, well, if they built a house somewhere in a, a village in the Northwest and Southwest, I think they can film that and put it on TV for all of us to see. Come on, this is a, a real comedy. This government has lost all trustworthiness. Uh, and I'm sorry to say it, uh, the present government is in no position to resolve the problems of Cameroon. And that's why the most appropriate, I think the most appropriate thing for the head of state to do is to step aside. This is a head of state that has not been able to address the people of the Northwest and Southwest for five years of conflict. He's not been able to make a single trip to the Northwest to try to uh, kind of uh, heal the pains, to try to ease the pains of the people of the Northwest and Southwest. And you're telling me this president has these people at heart? that this president wants to propose solutions to resolve the problems in the Northwest and Southwest. Northwest and the Southwest are considered the breadbaskets of Cameroon. 
and they are not the ones that should be given food in the streets of Wala and uh, Yaoundé. Those people should have the opportunity to return to their own homes and build up their own lives. They had, a li they had lives before they left, they were pushed out, and the government that pushed them out, should, that same government should push them back in so they can begin where they ended. Dr. Etan Ewone, as a political scientist, is abandoning or resigning, stepping down the right thing or the best thing a leader should do when his people are facing such challenges, when his people are in the midst of turbulent water. Is that the right thing for a leader to do, to abandon the people halfway? I'm glad you addressed me as a political scientist, and that's what I am. And uh, in political science, we have something they call uh, political responsibility. We are not saying Mr. Bia is directly responsible for the, all the failures of his government, but then he has to take political responsibility for the actions of his ministers and his administrators because he has that oversight function that has been entrusted into his hands by the people of Cameroon. He was elected, the ministers were not. He appointed them. And so if they fail, he has the powers to sanction. And since he's not sanctioning, he's simply telling us he's condoning what this, his government has been doing. And so political responsibility means also taking responsibility for your actions and stepping aside, recognizing your own failures it's not a weakness. It's a demonstration of strength. It's a demonstration of real leadership. Telling the people, well, you gave me a mandate for five years or seven years. I've not been able to fulfill this mandate. I am sorry. I'm stepping aside to give the opportunity for another Cameroonian to lead the, Cam the people of Cameroon into their desired future. That's what we call leadership. Mm -hmm. Leadership is not... Uh, staying on the presidential chair as if uh, someone spread you with uh, super glue they spread you with super glue that you're unable to quit to separate yourself from the state it's not a monarchy mm -hmm. it, it was handed to, over to mr bia while he was just 49 and he's getting to his 90 he should step aside also and give another young person the opportunity to lead cameroonians he inherited a prosperous peaceful country he's leaving us a poor, highly indebted country that is high, heavily polarized and divided. It's a real failure. He needs to step aside. And uh, you said earlier that he's not been sanctioning. The head of state has not been sanctioning. Probably that may be true to an extent as far as the Anglophone crisis or the security uh, crisis of which we are talking about uh, a concern. But he has been sanctioning uh, embezzlers of state funds, corrupt officials, sending them to jail, and so on. Yeah, that's that's also another another ridiculous thing about this government. Yeah, Mr. Bia has been sanctioning people, embezzlers, but they've been doing that selectively. So why are those who manage the funds of the the can 2021 still in government? They were promoted just at the moment that uh, it became public that these guys had uh, mismanaged, embezzled, siphoned uh, public funds. They got promoted for doing an excellent job, and they are still there. They've been strengthened. So you can't tell me they are selling, uh, sanctioning embezzlers. Those who fall out of favor with the government are sanctioned. Those who keep towing the line are still in power. So it's not a way, it's just kind of a... A, a kind of a political vengeance against the people they consider to be uh, to be uh, stubborn people that have refused to adhere to the authority of the governing uh, monarch. All right, we're going to take. Uh, we are going to take interviews of the week. Right now, we'll be back in some few minutes. Stay with us. If the night watchman of the uh, market wasn't vigilant, I think uh, this uh, would have caused the death of so many. Being a very busy day of the market, you know, having such, uh, uh, I would say, an element, a bomb 
at the entrance of the market where the people converge and it is always packed jam full if they detonated that bomb i am sure uh, not less than 25 50 people would have been killed everybody should increase the vigilance which we have because it is actually the people who can you know better play i would say security agent the police cannot be everywhere the soldiers the military officers cannot be everywhere so I think the population has to be very vigilant to make sure that, you know, they take note of every little minute irregularity which they find around. We have called on the population to be very vigilant. Very vigilant in the sense that every morning, every business person, nobody should minimize any object in front of his or her store. We are calling on the population to be once more collaborate with the forces of law and order to stamp out this criminality. So what, what makes secession worse is that those who carry secession out engage in, in gruesome, barbaric uh, methods of using um, weapons of mass destruction, bombs, be they artisanal or uh, or fabricated industry, the use of bombs, the use of artisanal bombs to kill people amounts to an act of mass destruction. And that is, as far as I know, as a, as a, a senior lecturer of international relations, an associate professor that I am, that is an act which is, uh, which is against international law, it's against hum human rights, it is against humanitarian law, and it's against the decency and the humanity of people. And those who are engaging in, in these sort of acts of uh, using uh, bombs or artisanal bombs or whatever bombs expose themselves to being, um, being um, prosecuted for crimes against humanity because the use of bombs to kill people in mass Innocent people, for that matter, civilians and, 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 and non-civilians, is considered in international law as an act against humanity. Registrars have been victims of kidnaps and molestation from Amber boys. Thus, they need to remind the hierarchy that we need more protection. Security measures should be multiplied. When a litigant or any user comes to the court, the first person they will meet is a registrar. Even the, our secretaries are all registrars. And it depends on how you attend to the public. That is the image that they carry back of the Justice Department. If you attend to them very well, you boost confidence in the Justice Department. We have prayed for Cameroon and we have advised the Muslim people brothers and sisters to have the good behaviors Muslim used to have. When he said you are Muslim man or woman, you have to get respect to the people and respect to also everybody. My population in Mutengene, I would like to seek to my population saying that all of us we should unite ourselves, then we should have peace. When there is a peace, there is a progress. Thank you for staying with us. Dr. Ita Ewane, you heard the Kumba City Mayor and the Divisional Officer for Kumba One Subdivision calling on the population to be more vigilant and to collaborate more with security and defense forces. Are these uh, possible solutions uh, or attitudes that can help to uh, put an end, why not eradicate all these happenings within the society, notably in those two regions? Yeah, what the, the city mayor said and the divisional officer for Kumba, I mean, those are important uh, short-term measures. People have to be very vigilant, not to touch anything they see, because you never know. It could be a book trap, and the moment you touch it, it explodes. So people have to be very vigilant. He, he made also a, a call on the population to collaborate with the military. Of course, that's an essential part uh, in the work, in the successful accomplishment of the uh, assignment of the military. You need the collaboration of the population. But what the, gov uh, the divisional officer 
has not mentioned is the fact that the, the population has lost faith in the, uh, both the troops, the military, uh, the troops of the Cameroon Armed Forces, the soldiers, and in the Ambazonian fighters. So if you collaborate with the uh, armed forces, you are in trouble with the Ambazonian fighters. If you collaborate with the Ambazonians, you are in trouble with the, uh, the, the soldiers. So the people, the population is caught into, the, into a difficult trap. Uh, I, I, I recognize the voice of uh, a gentleman who presented himself as an associate professor of uh, international relations and tried to give people lessons Professor Elvis Golengole. Elvis Golengole, uh, who unfortunately is from the same area like myself. I say unfortunately, because he's been one of those uh, castrated intellectuals that have led us into this mess. Uh, uh, okay, he talks about uh, war crimes please, committed by those be, who are putting uh, it, it, explosive devices. Please, it would be good for us to, to, to make a point uh, without using excuse me mr babila let me get to the end of my argument right go ahead yeah, please he, but he, he if, talks about if we don't use, use words that may not be good to the ears that would be better constituting a war crime but he fails to mention that the burning down of villages is the worst type of war crime the burning down of hospitals you no know, the mass uh, assassination of civilian populations by members of the armed forces. This constitutes essential elements of a, a possible war crime. They are all not possible, they are war crimes. And so if he wants to tell us the placing of a, 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 an explosive device, he calls it a war crime and refuses to mention about the villages that have been completely raised down, that have com been completely burned down by members of the armed forces. Yes, uh, the war crimes have been committed in Cameroon, but he should be honest enough to tell us that the, the crimes are committed from both sides of the aisles, but both by the Ambazonian fighters and by members of the Cameroonian armed forces. And so if we want to talk about this, we need to make an honest assessment. All right. In some few words, we wouldn't stop talking about the way out until all of these come to an end. We've been talking about this for quite a long time now, more than four years, and we'll keep talking until we get the right solutions in place. Where is the door out of the trouble was? Uh, the door has been identified internally and externally by some honest Cameroonians and by friends of Cameroon. The door is the national dialogue, a genuine national dialogue, and a reconciliation commission to ease pains. The keys of this door are with the president of the republic. He needs to open the door for national dialogue. So people, Cameroonians, should be able to look at each other into their faces and say, I am sorry, this is what happened. And together, we can make a, a new start. It's in a dialogue. Whether we fight for 50 years and get uh, 6 million, 10 million Cameroonians killed, we will go back to a dialogue. So why don't we do it now and save some lives and stop killing ourselves? So why don't we embark on a genuine dialogue? Uh, you know, this iron fist between the government of Cameroon and the Ambazonian Restoration Movement, it's not going to lead us into anywhere. Mr. Biakan recruit as many these as he wants his friends including those in paris in washington in, in london in berlin have all told him there is no military solution to this conflict and so he needs to retreat and call for a genuine national dialogue all right we are going to talk about africa now the african continent at large and we are looking at why the continent has been unable to take giant steps of development of industrialization despite its huge natural human and other resources that the continent is blessed with and before we do that uh, i want us to listen to dr israel davidson he's a senior lecturer newcastle business school 
Northern Beer, Northern Bria University, that is in Newcastle, United Kingdom. He is a chartered management accountant and researcher specialized in the accounting control, financial management, and performance measurement systems. Let's take a listen to him. Africa has a total area space larger than all of Europe. China and the United States of America combined. Yes, it is three times the area of China, three times the area of Europe, three times the area of the United States of America, meaning you can transplant China, Europe and United States and several other countries on the Africa continent and they will fit neatly. Africa is 30.5 million square kilometers and a youthful population of 1.3 billion inhabitants. China is 9.6 million square kilometers and 1.4 billion inhabitants. India has a total space of 3.3 million square kilometers and 1.4 billion inhabitants. Now, yet, Africa is projected as overpopulated and pressure mounts on Africans and their leaders to depopulate. Why? <laughs> Why? Now, please note, Africa is home to 60% of the world's arable land, 90% of raw material reserve, 40% of gold reserve, 33% of diamond reserve, 95% of platinum reserve, and holds the largest bauxite reserves in the world. Of course, in addition to manganese, woods, uranium, crude oil, and others. Yet, the continent is touted as the poverty capital of the world and ripe for depopulation. The question is, why? Well, President Jacques Chirac of France provides an illuminating insight. He said, we bled Africa for four and a half centuries. We looted their raw materials, then we told lies that the Africans are good for nothing. In the name of religion, we destroyed their culture. And after being made rich at their expense, we now steal their brains through miseducation and propaganda to prevent them from enacting black retribution against us." Unquote. Well, put simply, for over four centuries, Africa is not in control of its resources. Look, a 2016 study of Africa by the NGO called War on Want reveals that 101 companies, mostly British, control $305 billion worth of platinum, $276 billion worth of oil, and $216 billion worth of coal at 2016 market prices. Yes, they own mines or mineral licenses in 37 African countries and control vast swath of Africa's land, four times the size of the United Kingdom. Now look, Africa subsidizes the rest of the world by $32 billion annually. A 2017 report by Global Justice Now and other groups estimates that $161.6 billion enter into Africa, while $202.9 billion leave Africa almost every year. For example, in 2017, Africa received a total of $19.7 billion in aid, but paid back $18 billion in debt repayments. Debt burden is killing Africa. African governments have borrowed between 25 and 75 percent of their GDP, but with little or nothing to show for it. Africans in the diasporas remit not less than $32 billion annually, but multinational companies siphon $32.4 billion in profits and illicit financial outflows. Look, an estimated $29 billion are stolen via illegal logging, fishing and poaching annually. How can any continent, country or people accumulate and sustain wealth, growth and prosperity with such statistics? That's a great question. Well, look, hopefully, 
Now you know your Africa better. Edmond Mbiaka once wrote, Peace of mind always comes with knowing who you truly are, where you currently stand, where you positively need to be, and strongly believing in its possibility. Africa needs to control its resources, no doubt. For productive, patriotic, and effective leadership, we need our best and ablest citizens with fortified character in local, state, and federal governments. This must be given utmost consideration in upcoming elections across Africa. Let me say it once more, our problem is not the age of our leaders, but unfortified character. It is your responsibility to protect and defend your Africa. The starting point is to educate and transform the mindset of our leaders and peoples. Look, the least you can do is to assist with ensuring that this message reaches every African. Slavery destroyed us. Religion divided us. Ignorance controls us. And truth scares us. With these retrogressive forces, Africa will remain a dark continent. So we must renew our minds. What do you think is hindering African countries from coming out of what can be qualified today as a bondage imposed on it, imposed on the countries by the Western world and which has been there for so long, for years, for decades? What is hindering African countries, African leaders from taking these giant steps that's industrialization. Yeah, uh, Mr. Babila, let me say, I totally agree with the analysis uh, made by the Janet colleague. And uh, except for the fact that uh, in contrast to him, I think we have passed that stage of uh, diagnosis. I think the Africa's disease has been diagnosed uh, since uh, the 1960s. We all know what the problems in Africa are, huh? and why Africa is still in uh, such a dire state of development despite its uh, rich endowment in natural and uh, human resources. And uh, the colleague uh, just mentioned one resource that Africa has that makes it exceptional in today's uh, global economy. That's its uh, youthful population. The population of Africa is uh, it's 65% of the population is under 25 years old. And this is a natural, this is a resource into which Africa can tap for its uh, development projects. But this resource has become, has remained redundant simply because of a, a single element and a lack of opportunities for the young people. And he has also identified the main problem in Africa, and Africa's problem can be reduced to a single word, governance. Governance. Africa is poorly governed. The leaders that have been elected into the office are not serving the people, but rather they are serving themselves and serving their own their colonial masters. And now when you complain that uh, the colonial masters are exploiting Africa. For me, that's a very lame argument. This argument has been going on for over six decades, and it's time we drop this. I have heard constantly Cameroonians accusing France of exploiting Cameroon. And I just want to say that Mr. Macron or any other French president has been elected into office by the people of France. And it is his legitimate right to protect the people, of, the interests of the people of France even if that means going to tap resources of another country. Now, we say in international relations that there are no friends, there are, there's no friendship between states, but there are interests. So he's serving the interest. And it is our own responsibility to protect our interests. Now, if you, Mr. Babila, know that I, Ita Ewane, is exploiting you, 
it is your responsibility to put up ad adequate measures to protect yourself from being exploited. If you don't, it's your problem. If I give you a dagger and ask you to pierce the heart of your mother, if you do it, it's not my problem, it is your problem. So we have to take our own responsibility by recognizing what our needs are and identifying appropriate solutions on, or putting in place appropriate strategies and finding synergies between the different African countries so that collectively we can get to that di uh, desired destination. Collectively, we as a people can touch the peak of success. So it is our responsibility and we should stop playing this blame game. And also he mentioned an important solution by addressing the African population, of course. The African population has failed to take its responsibility. They have what it takes to change leadership, but they've never done that because of sometimes very trivial reasons like tribal tribes and uh, cultural affiliations. You don't vote for someone simply because it comes from your tribe. You vote for someone because he has a political program that addresses your needs so it's our the responsibility of our people to change leadership when they think such leadership it's not serving their interests so it's a double barrel solution why we try to do away with the old dictatorships in africa we need to conscientize the pop african populations so they take their lives into their own hands they take their destinies into their own hands by changing leadership that is not serving their, uh, them and putting in place leadership that can inspire hope for the young people. We've seen people in Africa that have inspired hope in young people. Recently, we saw President Magufuli of Tanzania, how he transformed his country within a short space of time. So this is African leaders should inspire themselves from the type of leadership that was put in place by uh, President Magufuli and stop complaining about exploitations by colonial administrations. We right. are a people with the same abilities as those in the West, and we should protect our interests using whatever we have at our uh, disposal to protect such interests. Dr. Ita Iwane, Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the Karl Hochschule International University in Germany. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Babila, and it's been a great pleasure. I wish you a pleasant weekend. Thank you. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. That's it for today.